Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Welcome to the Detroit Regional Chamber's latest Teletown Hall series. We certainly hope you are all well and healthy and staying healthy as we navigate the multiple situations and crises our region and our nation are continually to face. I am pleased to be joined by a good friend of the Chamber's and someone who doesn't have one job, who doesn't have two jobs, but she has three jobs. My friend, Mary Culler from the Ford Motor Company. Mary, welcome. Well, thanks, Sandy. And you know, they're the best jobs, so it's okay that I have three, because they're, <laughs> and they're for, all And I was just gonna say, I, I, I want our audience to know what those three jobs are. So Mary serves as the chief of staff to executive chairman, Bill Ford, which is a full-time plus job. She is the head of the Ford Motor Company Fund, another full-time plus job. And then of course, she is the project leader for Ford Motor Company's engagement in Corktown and the Michigan Central Station project uh, that Ford has been working on. So Mary, you know, let's take COVID and racial justice and economic collapse aside. How do you handle uh, having three incredibly high pressure jobs and high profile jobs all at once? Well, I have to say, you know, there's more synergies than you think. So that's the good news is, um, you know, obviously all of them report to the executive chairman, Bill Ford. So it's nice. I have one boss, which is great. And he's terrific. Um, but, you know, because uh, the Michigan Central Station, there's such a community angle to that particular project. And then on top, having the, the philanthropic arm of the company, there's a wonderful synergy there. And then, of course, just working for Bill, um, you know, his his passion is to really look at being visionary. And, you know, what we're doing at Michigan Central Station is is definitely that. And, and his vision is what's really driving us. Right. And how are you? I, I know uh, you, you've got kids. I, I know for mm -hmm. now you're, you're actually traveling right now. You're in northern Michigan. Wait. How has your family adapted to uh, all that is going on in our world right now? So I do have three kids, you know, I have um, a 17, a 16 and, and, a, and a 12 year old. And it's funny, I was saying to a friend, I don't know if it's better to have little, little kids where you're trying desperately to figure out, you know, during the pandemic, how to entertain them and keep them busy or having teenagers who, you know, really want to get out and see their friends. But, um, you know, I have to say they were terrific. We really did um, hunker down um, during the stay at home order. And it was rough at the, the beginning, but I think we all hit our groove. And, um, you know, apart from all the online schooling, which was, I think for everybody online, they know that it could be really tough. Um, especially for kids who don't like homework. I said, for, for one of my children who's not a great homework person, it became one big homework assignment. <laughs> so um, we had to kind of stay on it. But, you know, it was surreal, as you know. And, um, you know, it was, it was really great family time, though, I have to say. I mean, we really did try to find the silver lining, as I know a lot of people did. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad, most importantly, everyone's healthy, right? Everyone is healthy. And, you know, we're not from Michigan originally. So I think, you know, for those who understand this, the hardest part was really not being able to get together with family, you know, extended family. My parents are in Florida, my sister's in North Carolina. Um, and, you know, because no one was traveling, um, you know, I haven't seen my parents in probably the longest amount of time, um, you know, in a very, very long time because there's just not a possibility to travel and see them. Right, exactly. I think so. for so many of us, uh, this is the longest period of time that we haven't seen uh, family or, frankly, have been on an airplane. Uh, I can't right. remember a stretch this long that I have not been on an airplane. So. Yeah, well, I, I, don't know how, I, I don't know if I miss the work travel that much. I have to be frank, Sandy. So. <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough. I, I, I will grant you that. So, you know, Mary, the last time uh, we were together was at the Detroit Policy Conference, which uh, was sponsored by the Chamber, which was back in uh, February. You spoke at that, and we thank you for that. But, you know, the world is so radically different than it was in February. I mean, so when I look at just how the world has impacted Ford Motor Company, I mean, uh, the COVID crisis uh, shut down not just vehicle assembly, but obviously sales for a, a long period of time. You've had to reconfigure uh, your plants. Uh, the Ford team is largely working from home. Uh, the social needs have exploded because of the dual health and economic crises. And we're all responding to this social awakening around racial justice issues. So we have an awful lot to talk about in all of these crises 
uh, and situations directly impact your work at Ford Motor Company. So my first question, Mary, is what is the mood amongst your fellow Ford uh, team members uh, as the company navigates and responds uh, to these various situations and crises? Well, I have to say, I mean, to your point, Sandy, I mean, I, I don't think there's ever been a time where, um, you know, we hadn't, we weren't making anything, anything around the world. I mean, every single plant was shut down, as you know, um, and that was obviously incredibly unprecedented. And then to your point, as you, you talked about the dealerships being closed and just the entire whole chain, um, you know, was, was shut down. But but what's terrific is I have to tell you, I mean, what I've always noticed about Ford is we are the best when our backs are against the wall. And so, you know, our team really um, threw themselves in not only to figuring out how to manage um, that aspect of the business, but really then seeing how we could help the country. Right. And and I, there's nothing that I am more proud of than how quickly Ford stepped in to help with um, the crisis around the pandemic. When you think about, you know, as you know, the PPE situation, we were getting calls from hospitals saying, hey, do you have any N95 masks that we could have? And we were literally, you know, shipping them to the Henry Ford Hospital. We were giving them to U of M. Um, and then, of course, we had our large ventilator um, project with uh, GE, which was really phenomenal. I, I actually was able to be on some of those phone calls as that evolved and to see how quickly the team rallied to jump in. I mean, this is sort of part of our 117 year history, right? We're the arsenal of democracy. And when things, um, when the country needs help, we step in to help, you know, just as we did during the wars to make, um, you know, uh, bombers and other things. So I don't know, I mean, in some ways, I've never been more proud to be a Ford employee, right? Because I think what we were able to do in a short amount of time um, was phenomenal. And, and I'll just say, you know, that's a real testament to manufacturing. I just want to say that to the, to the folks who are listening, because, you know, for all that we talk about technology and, and all this, you know, uh, future innovation, this sort of core manufacturing capability is so critical. And, and I think it was proven during that time because we, we rallied to make, you know, these incredible numbers of things, you know, 20 million face shields, you know, like in a, in a drop of a hat, right? Um, so I, I just don't ever want to estimate the power of manufacturing and obviously the car companies and Ford in particular really know how to do it well. Now, obviously, you know, uh, you know, you pivoted so, uh, so hard so quickly. And, you know, those of us who, you know, live in this region and are familiar with, uh, the Ford Motor Company and view, you know, basically the Ford family as, as our extensions of our family, we're just so proud of what Ford did. But let's talk about the ventilators just just for a second here. Now, the ventilators, were you making just the GE ventilators? Or if I remember correctly, you actually at Ford kind of created some own in, your own innovations to uh, into those ventilators. So what you weren't just producing somebody else's ventilator, you actually had some uh, some Ford uh, some Ford innovation in those ventilators. Yeah, I mean, our F-150 engineers started taking parts from the F-150, thinking they would actually make a lot of sense on the ventilators. Um, you know, there were a couple of things. One is that, you know, the supplies of things um, weren't available. So we had to be very um, nimble and innovative around, you know, using other things. And so to your point, um, our Ford engineers did a terrific job kind of finding parts, frankly, that we use on cars and other things that, that really worked for the ventilators. And then we just needed to scale up, right? So GE... Um, you know, that partnership um, was, was really all about scaling up, which was incredible. And then we also had the partnership with 3M on the PAPRs, which is a whole different kind of system. But, you know, that, that system was also um, all about scaling. And, um, you know, I had an opportunity to go to our Rossonville plant um, where we were making these. And, and what was amazing, Sandy, is that you've got to remember, this was during the the absolute heat of the whole pandemic. And we had, you know, UAW employees and other employees raising their hands saying, I want to come back to work. I want to make these. Um, and of course, our entire operations needed to be set up in a way that was safe um, and work for folks. And if you went to the plant, you know, you saw all the plastic dividers, all the spacing. Um, but all, I mean, when you think about it, all this happened like overnight right i mean and so i was just incredibly impressed with our manufacturing uh and engineering folks because it really it really was a testament to how quickly we can pivot when we need to 
Now, I imagine you learned a lot, the company learned a lot about, you know, how to keep a manufacturing facility safe in the COVID era with, as you said, you know, you know, uh, barriers, social distancing. So what kind of lessons were you able to adapt from making ventilators, continuing your manufacturing uh, of ventilators as you transition to reopening uh, your vehicle assembly facilities? Yeah, I mean, there was no doubt that that was a great return to work playbook opportunity because we were, you know, kind of testing things along the way. So I think we were very early in, in sort of figuring out what our policies was. And that, you know, is basically everything that a lot of people are doing now from, you know, getting to the plant, you get your temperature tested, um, you know, you have to fill out a survey before you actually arrive. Once you get there, you have to adhere to the social distancing. And then of course, you know, in a manufacturing plant, um, the spacing and the, the, the plastic shielding between folks, especially for the ventilators was really important. But so many of those policies did feed into our return to work playbook. And, you know, it is, like I said, what you see everywhere now is sort of a standard. Right. So um, what's the latest on Ford's production of PPE? Is that still ongoing? Has, has that a need been addressed and you've moved on to uh, producing Mustangs and F-150s again? <laughs> well, we the good news is we are producing um, Mustangs and F-150s, and we just had our F-150 launch um, last evening, our, our new I unbased F-150, which is really, really, was really exciting. There's a lot of great features on that vehicle, including, obviously, um, you know, the electrification aspect of it. But, um, you know, absolutely. I mean, when, when you, you start to think about the fact that we had to get all the vehicle launches back up and running around the world. Um, we are still doing quite a bit of PPE. We have scaled back fields um, because we made so many of those and so did a lot of other people, frankly. Um, so we've scaled back on that, but we're still um, in the business of making the ventilators. Now, speaking of you know making uh, Mustangs and F-150s, I've heard uh, actually from uh, one of the Ford board members that the sales of vehicles, uh, at least particularly Fords, uh, in the month of May was much stronger than initially anticipated. Something like 92% of May 2020 sales uh, were, uh, or May 2020 sales were 92% of May 2019 sales. So that seems to be a really positive sign for uh, our automotive industry. So, you know, what was interesting, Sandy, throughout the entire pandemic, as you know, the dealers were shut down, a lot of them, and, you know, but, but they quickly pivoted to online sales. So that was yet another innovation. I mean, interestingly enough, you'd think that all the dealers had online sales, but they didn't because, you know, a lot of them had never really had to offer that service. So um, they really pivoted um, to that and, and even to the point where they were delivering these vehicles to people's homes. And to your point, even throughout the pandemic, we were really surprised by how strong sales actually stayed. And now, um, you know, sales are very good, which is which is really great news. Um, I, I know that the one area that has been really tough has been fleet sales. Fleet sales have gone way down. And so that's an important part of the business that we have to keep our eye on. But but overall, I would say, um, you know, sales of vehicles have been fairly good. Okay. Now, I know I'm going to stray into an area that isn't necessarily your expertise, but uh, uh, are you aware of how the sales mix might have changed? Uh, are people looking for something different post, uh, you know, kind of post stay at home than they were uh, back in February? No, I mean, I think, you know, obviously um, our best selling vehicles are still selling well. I don't think we've seen a huge shift in in the the type of platform that that's being sold. I mean, obviously, we all know that that um, small SUVs are still super popular. Um, you know, I, I think for, for us, like you like you said, it's really more about producing enough of these vehicles and having the the supply um, to meet the demand. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I could be be wrong, but but I don't believe I've heard anyone talk about that at great levels. I mean, what we do talk about, as you know, is in this new world, will people be less likely to get in an Uber, get in a Lyft? Are people going to want their own personal vehicle? Um, you know, how is this really going to affect um, the whole concept of shared transportation, right? And and it's interesting. I, there's a lot of conversation around it. I don't. I don't think we're we're anywhere near um, a point where we actually know how it's going to play out. But there's certainly a lot of discussion about how this might affect 
um, how people move around. I'm going to apologize to my audience. Uh, uh, our landscapers have decided to show up just at this moment. Uh, <laughs> I know. Hey, that was the best thing about the pandemic was no landscapers. I said, you know, it was so quiet. And then all of a sudden, when everyone started back to work, you could hear the leaf blowers again. I, the leaf blowers, the trimmers, <laughs> uh, it's all happening right outside that wall. So I apologize. <laughs> I know my uh, husband it, laughs. It's like my biggest anxiety moment. I'm like, why are these leaf blowers so loud? Why hasn't someone invented something quiet? <laughs> and now, of course, I got a, I have a, I have a phone call either from, um, it's either going to be from Donald Trump or Joe Biden. I get, I get them from both well, that's sides. That's important. <laughs> Please feel free to take it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah. Well, uh, an automated call. So anyway, I apologize for all the noise, uh, everyone. That's all right. Uh, let's move on, Mary, to uh, the Ford Motor Company Fund. Uh, the fund has been such a, a force for good, and not just in Michigan, but beyond our state. Uh, obviously, you've had to pivot, uh, you and your team at the fund, uh, to respond to uh, these multiple crises. Can you give us some examples about how the Ford Motor Company Fund has made a, a hard turn to address some of the immediate needs. Yeah, so you know, we talked a lot about what the enterprise was doing in the in this huge effort around ventilators, but what I'm really proud of is our Ford Fund team who um, literally overnight pivoted to help communities because that was really what we needed to do. And there were things that came up very quickly around food, shelter, and transportation. And so, um, you know, obviously we have some incredible partnerships um, with community organizations and we quickly pivoted to work with them to ensure that we could still deliver food. Um, and when you start to think about some of the challenges, the first was transportation. So one of the, the, the things that I love is that, and this is like a perfect example of where in the pandemic, you like all bureaucracy gets set aside, all worry about liability. So we had all these vehicles sitting around, you know, think about it, all of our Ford shuttles that used to take employees around were sitting at world headquarters. You know, we had Lincoln personal drivers. We have a, a, a personal driver program who now weren't driving anybody anywhere, right? We deployed all those vehicles to move food small businesses deliver food. Um, I mean, the numbers were incredible. We were delivering 11,000 meals to healthcare workers, you know, 400,000 pounds of food out of um, our food, um, you know, like our Gleaners Food Bank in our Ford Resource Engagement Center. Um, we delivered um, a, like 5,000 face shields to um, Detroit EMTs and, you know, other uh, firefighters. So what was incredible was this, this pivot to just making sure that things were getting to people who needed them. And the other thing we did very quickly is that we, um, we gave $500,000 um, uh, right off the bat and then did a, a match. And so our employees could then go online and match our COVID match program to local community organizations and to organizations all around the world. Uh, and that was really fun to see. I mean, just seeing the numbers go up because the employees wanted to help. And, and you've got to remember, we have a really large employee base who are used to volunteering. So we have a volunteer corps at the Ford Fund. Usually they're out in the community um, doing things. And now they were kind of trapped at home and they wanted to help. So we started thinking about how could they do things virtually. And we even did things like, you know, reading books online and then we would give them to our community partners so that they could share them with families who were desperately looking for things for kids to do. So um, it was an exciting, I mean, I think it's an exciting time and it's just a testament to how important um, this arm of the, of the company is to the community because um, we really, I think, had a, had a terrific impact. Well, the, uh, the pivot's been impressive. And how do you anticipate uh, the work of the fund uh, kind of long-term implications of what we're going through? For the fund? So, I mean, I think, you know, um, we all know that this, this has been such a really hard time. I mean, to your point, Sandy, you talked about the pandemic, then now we have all the um, diversity and inclusion and race issues that we're obviously also very involved in. And, you know, community organizations are really struggling right now. I mean, th this has been a huge hit for them as well as they um, are trying to maneuver through this difficult time. So, you know, we're going to try to be the best partner we can be to our community organizations, but we're all impacted, right? I mean, think about Ford Motor Company. We didn't make anything for three months. Um, so, you know, um, we have been impacted financially by that, but we're still 
uh, very committed to doing all we can. Um, you know, I took over the, the organization in January, and when I first came on board, I was already about to start kind of a strategic uh, look at our programming, just so that we can ensure that we're, um, you know, making the best and greatest impact where we can. I, I'm a big believer that transportation is a huge opportunity. Um, you know, mobility is the number one way to get people out of poverty. If you can get somebody to um, school or a job, um, it can make a huge difference. And so that's one area that I'm excited about, um, you know, expanding upon. I think we need more mobility programs in our philanthropic um, uh, arm. But look, I am so proud of the team, and and there's no doubt that our community engagement um, has been extensive. Um, so it's been a really eye-opening and wonderful experience for me personally. Well, that's great. We'll, we'll, we look forward to future work there. So uh, I want to remind our audience, uh, I should have done this at the top of the program. Uh, if you have a question for Mary Culler, uh, please go to the question box uh, in the, you should have a panel on the right hand side of your screen with a little arrow. It says questions afterwards, and you can just open that up and type in a question for, for Mary and uh, Glenn Stevens, the executive director of Michado, uh, is monitoring that, uh, that question box. So uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, Mary, let's move to uh, Michigan Central Station. Uh, you know, a signature pro uh, project for not just the Ford Motor Company, but for Bill Ford personally, a signature project for the state of Michigan and Detroit. Uh, obviously, a lot of people are asking, you know, <laughs> gosh, you know, this is this is a this is a really unusual time. The automotive industry is being hit really hard. What does that mean for Michigan Central Sta uh, train station in Corktown? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a great question, but, you know, we have always viewed this um, particular initiative as um, kind of the vision for the future of mobility, not only for the city and the region, but for our own company as well. I mean, I think the whole concept has always been, how do we push our own thinking through this particular project? So we are absolutely still prioritizing our work there. We, we obviously shut down for seven to eight weeks um, construction-wise, so that's gonna impact um, the schedule a little bit, but not significantly. Um, you know, we're still on track to deliver the project, you know, by 2023. Um, the book depository, um, which is the building next to the train station has been delayed about six months, but there's a lot of work that's still going on. The good news is that we're back up and um, we're back working, and anybody who drives um, around that area will see all the scaffolding on the train station, um, the pictures are incredible. I would really encourage people um, to go to our Michigan Central website. We just actually, um, we also have a Facebook page, but some of the photos are just fantastic. I mean, even the book depository, which I think is a bit of a sleeper, but is a beautiful building. Um, the way it looked before and the way it looked now inside, you, you wouldn't even recognize it. I mean, all the debris and it's all been cleaned up. Um, so now we really need to, to work towards our vision of really creating this innovation mobility district. And, you know, we think we're on um, a really good path to do that. And so we're excited because, as you know, it's really about partnerships. And so we're looking, obviously, for, you know, a lot of partnerships as we move forward. So, Mary, uh, tell our audience a little bit more about that vision. Uh, obviously, I've had a chance of uh, knowing you and knowing the project a little bit, but it's not just going to be a place for Ford Motor Companies mobility work, you're talking about bringing in, you know, entrepreneurial companies, partner companies to partner in mobility, a uh, potential test track, a retail space. Give us the, give us the vision. Of yeah, what that so, um, you know, to your point, I mean, I think everyone thinks it's going to be a, a Ford campus, and, and that's not the vision. The vision is really to create this innovation mobility district, and what that means is that we'll not only have these buildings that will be clustered, and there'll be a lot of activity in those, and the train station, of course, there'll be retail and community um, areas, and it'll be a real destination place. Um, there'll be offices in there. In the book depository, we're seeing more of makerspace, more of an entrepreneurial feel, kind of gritty. It's kind of where work gets done. And then we're going to build a third building next to the train station, which, you know, will be a very a great hub for innovation, maybe a learning center, which would be terrific. But one of the things that I think is the most exciting about the project is all the infrastructure around the buildings, which people kind of forget about. And that's really where we're doubling down to, to make this a connected um, infrastructure where we can really test mobility solutions, um, bring other partners in to help us do that. 
we call it an open platform. And what that means is that we want everyone to come there. And, and frankly, if they're competitive, competitors of ours, we're fine with that because we just want to make sure that we're doing the most innovative and the most exciting and best things there and that we're all learning from each other. Um, so we really do see this incredible collaborative ecosystem with a lot of different partners. Well, it's, 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 it's going to be amazing. Now, before I turn it over to uh, Glenn Stevens to uh, get to the audience questions, uh, Mary, uh, a few minutes ago, you mentioned uh, how uh, the health crisis was impacting uh, ride sharing. Uh, how do you think uh, that the public attitudes might be uh, affected uh, about adopting autonomous vehicles? You know, uh, you know, one of the visions has been that you know we move, move to these kind of shared autonomous vehicles. Uh, uh, you know, kind of in mass in the next 20 years or so. Do you think this crisis is going to impact that adoption? Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, a month ago, my my answer might have been different. You know, I, I think it's going to depend, right? Because I think for anybody who looks around and sees how people are kind of getting back um, in some ways to their normal life, um, it's hard to tell. Um, a couple of months ago, as we all knew, we we were we weren't even leaving our house and we didn't want to even, I mean, I remember even taking walks in my neighborhood. I mean, everyone was doing the big arch around the, the tree, right? So that you didn't walk past each other. And now, you know, to be frank, you know, when I take a walk in my neighborhood, people are walking like they always did. So I don't know if I have the answer to that, Sandy, really. I mean, ideally, um, you know, I think autonomous vehicles are going to have an incredible impact on, on things, just as we discussed, you know, getting people out of poverty, you know, it's a great way to move people, um, you know, so I'm really excited about the technology, but how, how the pandemic is going to impact it, I don't know if I really have the answer. Well, I, and you're so right about uh, uh, mobility's impact on, on poverty and the economy. And one of the chamber's mottos is, is that if you want the economy to succeed, if you want families su to succeed, you know, give them the opportunity to make money and spend money. And to make money and spend money, they need mobility. So absolutely. Well, let me uh, welcome uh, Glenn Stevens, uh, the executive director of Michado and vice president of the chamber to uh, go through some audience questions. Glenn, I'll turn it over to you for a while. Thanks, Sandy. Hi, Mary. Hi, Glenn. Good to see you. Thanks for your time yeah. today. Um, let me pick up on a couple things real quick. We've got a few questions and a little bit of time left, but you uh, had a big announcement yesterday, and um, that involves a partnership, and that involves this ecosystem and your commitment that you were talking to, uh, New Lab. Can you tell us about that and, and, and where this came from and where it's going? And uh, that'd be great. Yeah, so, you know, I talked about the Innovation uh, Mobility District, and we've talked about the importance of partnerships, and I think there's going to be a, a huge opportunity to partner with, with local entrepreneurs, and we are absolutely um, excited about doing that. Um, we had been talking to New Lab for a while just because we had seen their um, ecosystem in New York, um, and they've done a really incredible job of bringing some interesting folks together. Um, you know, in a, in a dynamic setting. And they, they curated that very carefully. It's interesting when you look at their model, the first year they have a building, the first year they only had like 30% of, of people in their building. Now they have like a 1500 person wait list. But it's because they almost, they, they handpicked everybody because they wanted this ecosystem to be uh, perfect. So we're, we're talking to them about how they might be able to help us longer term in our ecosystem. But for now, one of the exciting things is we're partnering with them to do what we're calling uh, two studios. And these studios are really about solving macro problems. So um, one is a corporate studio that Ford will be funding. And, you know, we're thinking, as, as Sandy said, as we think about some of the big challenges around mobility, what are those things that aren't proprietary, things that if we could solve together, it would help everybody. Um, and so we're, we are excited about doing that with New Lab and helping get their thoughts about how we bring partners in to do that. And then the second studio, which I'm excited about, is the Civic Studio, um, which is basically solving a social problem. This is a community-oriented opportunity to think about how we, we help the community. And so in that one, we're also going to be sponsoring that, but looking for partners, you know, and maybe foundations and others who really want to help solve kind of a big social problem around mobility. Um, so we think these will be kind of 
like I, I sparks to get um, the thinking catalyzing going in, in our development. And so we're gonna be starting as early as the summer. The nice thing in the world of the pandemic is these studios can start virtually and they don't necessarily need bricks and mortar. So um, I think it's gonna be great. And what's nice about New Lab is they're very excited about um, being a part of the Detroit um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. So I think they're very excited about uh, connecting with folks locally as well. That's fantastic. We, um, as you know, we've been working with your team and uh, Julie Roschini and, and some others that just, you got, you have a phenomenal team that you put together. I love my team. They're the best. We've yeah. made some progress just in a few months and it's all, all, you know, due to them. Well, and they've been out engaging and, 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 you know, finding out where can, where's the synergy, you know, where, what's the landscape look like? Um, and one of the big questions that we get a lot, and I know they do all the time and someone has asked it today is, how does a company, uh, an entrepreneur, a startup, how do they engage with, with the project, with your team? Yeah, absolutely. Julie Rossini, who I'm sure she's going to love that I'm giving her name to everybody, but that's her job. She's um, head of our external partnerships. And, you know, um, we obviously are open to, to hearing from anybody who's interested. We also have, like I said, um, some websites. If you go to Michigan Central, you'll find um, you know, our different uh, pages where you can certainly go on and, and request, um, you know, connecting. So, but I'm available too. I mean, obviously I'm easy to find. Um, I'm at Ford, but we're, we're really open for business. We've said that many times. And I do think that um, people are beginning to understand our vision better, um, you know, as we roll out some of these um, announcements. And Sandy, to your point, even when you and I were together um, in, in January, even when I sort of talked about the vision, it, it's really incredible. I, I know we were kind of working behind the scenes for a year and a half, but now it just feels very um, solidified and now we're just off to the races. We're really excited. Yeah, that's fantastic. So one of the things you touched on on earlier with uh, with Sandy was uh, your your community engagement. And a lot of people don't know about your, your resource centers that you have. Yeah. Um, and I, and can you talk a little bit about those resource centers? Cause I know, I think there's two in Detroit and I know there's some others, but this is a big, big connection for the community and in specifically Detroit. Yeah. So what's exciting is to your point, Glenn, we have two resource centers, one on the east side of the city and then one in Southwest. Um, I have spent more time at the one in Southwest, um, just because to your point, it's very close to the train station. It just turned out to be that way. That that um, resource center has been there for over 10 years, and that has served the community in a variety of ways. There's a Gleaner's Food Bank attached to that resource center. Um, there's also an opportunity for people to go there, and we have um, Ford employees and others who pr help people with their taxes and other things. And then there's a lot of community programming for kids. But this is a bricks and mortar place where people can go and you can imagine during the pandemic, it was really a loss not to have the resource center open. And we did everything we could to keep the pieces of the center open that were really integral to the community, one being the food bank. Um, and so that Gleaner's Food Bank stayed open throughout the entire pandemic. And we actually had volunteers delivering food to people who couldn't get out. On the east side, it's more entrepreneurial. It's more um, people who are trying to start businesses and getting support for their businesses and other types of services. But you know, we have them around the world as well. And what we find is these resource centers become the kind of the hub of the community. And I'm really proud of them because they've been around for a very long time. And 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 frankly, if anything, we just need to get do a better job of getting the word out about them because they're a fantastic resource. And it, and it sure seems that given the this the social issues that we're wrestling with today, always have been, but the social injustice issues and the, the cultural mixes that that these resource centers and Ford's commitment to the community can can play a big role as we heal and build and move things forward. Absolutely. I mean, all of them are about diversity and inclusion. I mean, when you go to the resource center, you'll see just um, there's just a lot of different um, demographic of people using the resource center, everything from age to gender to, to race. And so you know, we love these centers because they are kind of um, a place where everyone can come together. I mean, you know, it's interesting because, as we know, the tragedies of, of the George Floyd situation have been, been horrific and I think have made us all really self-reflect on um, what our role is, you know, moving forward. And I know as Ford employees, it's really, um, uh, really motivated everybody to think about what more they can do. 
what's interesting is that you know we're really proud at Ford and the Ford Fund of our legacy in that area. I mean, we've we've actually worked for over 70 years with African American um, community organizations, the ones that you would know, like the NAACP and the Urban League and others. Um, but you know, others you may not know. And one of the programs that I love is that um, we actually have a first generation Spelman College program where we're funding um, you know, kids uh, to go through the whole four years. And we um, just had our first cohort of four year uh, graduates and, and our uh, person that we supported is the valedictorian of her class, which is like incredible. You know, we've given over $60 million of scholarships um, over the last 20 years to African-American um, you know, organizations. So, you know, we've been in this, but we have to do more. I mean, we all know that. And so I, I think um, we're all excited about collaborating with others to to figure out how we can really solve these really um, important issues that we all need know we need to do. Well, thanks. I'm going to turn it back over to Sandy, but I, I'll, I'll share one quick thing with you. Last night, I had a conversation with a, a Ford retiree um, up here, and he worked for Ford many, many, many years and actually used to run the Rossonville plant um, a long time ago. Um, I did not know that. He was a plant manager early in his career. But the thing we were talking about, the thing that made the biggest impact about on me last night was the sense of pride and community that Ford employees, uh, you know, working for Fords, um, that, that expression. And so what you're doing with the fund and the company and the products, and, and certainly with, with, the, with Michigan Central, um, kudos to all of you. We look forward to keep working with you on it. Thank you. Well, Over I know we're out of time, but you know, thanks, Glenn, for that. And you know, we're a family company, and I think you know, it it starts with um, we're very fortunate. It starts with um, our executive chairman, Bill Ford, who I think really sets the tone for the importance of of being a family company and always giving back. Certainly does. Thanks, thanks, Mary. Over to you, Sandy. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Glenn. Hey, uh, Mary, I know we're running late, but there's a, just a couple things in the chat box. I I want to sure. do a speed speed Absolutely. round with you. I can keep you from your family just a few minutes longer. Uh, no, so I've... quick question. How do Ford spouses get involved in the volunteer opportunities that Ford employees uh, can partake in? So it's interesting you should say that. You know, it used to be that the Ford Fund Volunteer Corps was only just the employees, and then it was tied to kind of a 16-hour employee program. Um, we've been challenged to think about how we can engage um, everybody, the family, um, you know, in volunteer programs. So we're not quite there yet, but, um, you know, we're definitely going to be there very soon because we realize that everyone wants to participate. And so, you know, stay tuned, um, and anybody's welcome to, to connect with me and we'll make sure that, that they're notified as soon as you know there's an opportunity. Uh, next uh, speed round question. Uh, uh, you recently made some news of uh, the company about using dome lights in police vehicles that can be superheated to kill uh, uh, germs and viruses. Uh, so two part question. One, uh, is that something you see potentially moving into production vehicles and uh, uh, B, what other kinds of things are you looking from the supply base? Well, I'm not an expert in that, but I thought that was a super cool project. I certainly, you know, was in meetings when we talked about it. Um, you know, that was yet another invention by, you know, four employees that came about very quickly. Um, you know, our research and engineering folks are fantastic. And so that was very relevant. Very I think you know it probably will be something that could be you know implemented um, throughout. Um, regarding the supply chain, I, I don't know if I can answer that. To be frank, I don't really have an answer. But um, you know, certainly, like I said, if anyone wants to contact me, we'd be happy to get back to them. Great. And finally, I'm going to end uh, with a message from a mutual friend of ours, uh, Terry Radigan, our friend from General Motors, uh, sends the message of the General Motors family salutes Mary and the Ford team for everything they do for the greater Detroit community. Uh, we are excited to work with you. Uh, thank you, Terry Radigan. Well, that's really nice. And they're doing amazing things as well, as you know, they stepped in too. So thank you so much for that. Well, I, I think all of us are so proud of the work that uh, General Motors and Ford uh, have done, uh, not just for uh, Michigan and the Detroit community, but uh, for the incredible role that uh, your two companies have played nationally uh, in helping this nation get through uh, the, the health crisis, the economic crisis, and the leadership role that uh, both of your leaders are taking in uh, this racial justice uh, work that is so important and needs to be addressed. 
Well, I appreciate Sandy. And I would just say to the audience, if you didn't get a chance to watch the 60 Minutes piece that ran, you know, a couple of months ago, where I, I know that GM and Ford were were highlighted for their work um, during the COVID pandemic, I think it's a great piece, and it really, to your point, makes makes anyone super proud to to be from this area, and you know, obviously affiliated with with um, you know an industry that can can do so much good for the world. Great. Well, Mary, uh, we kept you a little bit longer than we had promised. Uh, we kept you from your family longer than we had promised. No, so. it's perfect. <laughs> So thank you for being so generous with your time. Thank you for uh, all of the support that you and Bill have provided the chamber, provided the region, uh, and just thanks for taking some of your personal time to be with us today. Well, this is fun. You know, I love to always have conversations with you, Sandy, and thank you for everything you do because obviously without a strong chamber and, and your engagement on these incredible issues, um, we wouldn't be as successful. So, so thank you. I hope well, everyone- healthy and has a great so. weekend all right mary enjoy enjoy your weekend enjoy your family we'll talk to you soon okay okay bye, -bye. thank you bye everyone have a good weekend everyone take care of yourselves and take care of each other bye bye thanks mary that was great okay now you thanks. can get back to actually having holiday okay. Huh? You can get back to having a holiday. <laughs> I was laughing. I was like, oh my gosh, this has been, but it's good. And what time is Julie's thing today? 2 p.m. What time? 2 to 3. 2 p.m. Can you hear me? I'll text it to you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs>